Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review. Here with us, we are studying this week, Laying Up Treasure in Heaven. And our topic for today is From Deceiver to Prince. From Deceiver to Prince. But before we go into our discussion, we'll have a word of prayer by Dr. Ellis and a memory text by Elder Ellis. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying your words. We thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the revelation in your words. I pray today as we study, we would understand the depth of your love and your forgiveness and your mercy, and that we will come boldly to your throne asking forgiveness and experiencing pardon. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Our memory text is taken from Mark 8, 36 and 37. And it says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. Amen. A very interesting text this week. So we're going to go into our understanding of the text. What are the thoughts, the main points that come out to you from our memory text this week? To begin with Dr. Ellis and then Elder Ellis will give us his point of view of our memory text this week. Good morning, everyone. And our memory text from Mark 8, 36 is very interesting because when you consider the many things we give up for our soul without realizing it, it is amazing, it's appalling. But the Bible is saying, what does it profit a man if he gains this whole world? People are running after riches. People are running after fame. People are running after all kinds of things. But the, the end result is nothing if we lose out on soul salvation. So the thing that comes out to me is living a life that is pleasing in the sight of God and let him help us to live overcomers life that we will not have the longing for the things of this world, but that we will live as though we were pilgrims here, knowing that there is a better place prepared for us. When I look at this text, as a businessman, I, so many thoughts go through my head. Because in business, you invest for a return. Invest for gain. No one invests to lose, even though losing is part of the business world. But one always looks for good returns. But here we are looking at a different kind of investment. Whether one should invest in early th earthly things, because as Dr. Taylor says, People go out and they do all manner of things for worldly games. But these things do not, from a spiritual standpoint, to a large extent, unless the worldly games are going to be used to further God's cause, perhaps the games are misdirected. But here we are seeing. It's a matter of choice. Whether one is going to invest time, invest treasure, in, invest talent, invest a body temple for worldly gains or for their soul salvation. Not only their soul salvation, but for the salvation of others. It's a choice. What will it profit a man if he gains everything? and lose out on salvation. Salvation is priceless. Jesus came and he died 
that we could have salvation and oh, what a loss that would be if there is no hope beyond the grave. And that's a sobering question that Jesus would have asked. And that is one that we all ought to take very seriously. What can we give in exchange for salvation? Amen. So we're going to ask Dr. Ellis to turn to Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. And the question here is, what happened here to Jacob and what spiritual lessons can we take from this story about God's grace, even when we make the wrong decisions? And Elder Ellis will begin answering that question for us. I'll read it over after we hear our so we are looking at Genesis, Genesis 32, 22 to 31. And he rose early that night and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over for of the Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped. On his hip. What happened here to Jacob and what was a spiritual lesson we can take from this story about God's grace even when we make the wrong decisions? Now when you look at this story, this is really a story that it's a part of a story where the Jacob as his name, as part of his characteristic, was, was being played out. His name meant supplanter, deceiver, and what we are studying in this lesson is from deceiver to prince. Jacob had, as it were, deceived his brother out of the birthright, as a result, he had to flee from his father's house. And he left there, he went to his uncle's place, and you know the story, he spent 20 years. Worked 14 years for his two wives, and another six years for his uncle so that he gained possessions. He left empty-handed and he came back with a lot. However, he was going back to face his brother, uh, Esau. And for the 20 years that Jacob would have been away, his story plagued him. You know, we all have a life conscience. And so Jacob was wrestling with what he had done to gain the portrait. The portrait was a good thing, but 
it was earned by deception, and now he had to face his brother. And so the story tells us there that he separated his wives and so on. He had his own strategy as to how he would have faced his brother. However, he went by himself. And as he was sleeping, as he was meditating, as he was going over the challenges that he would have faced, he was confronted by a being. And there he wrestled with the being. What Jacob really needed was Jacob needed freedom from his conscience, some sort of freedom from the act that he would have committed that plagued him over 20 years. He needed release. And so he wrestled with, as it were, a being that was supernatural. And as the Bible said, because of his tenacity, he prevailed. And from that experience, his name was changed from deceiver. He was forgiven. He accepted forgiveness. He realized that God had pardoned him. And so we see there that his name was changed. What spiritual lesson can I gain from that? We, in our situation where we were exposed by the old man, the old man of sin, all man of thoughts will come to our minds. Thoughts that will plague us. The devil also, who is the accuser of the brethren, will bring things back to our mind to accuse us to say it doesn't matter how you struggle it doesn't matter how you want to serve the lord god will not forgive you but we serve a merciful father who is willing to forgive who is willing to change our names from what we used to be to be in saints christians servants of the living god and I like that. That's the God that I serve. Well, I think that it was in desperation that Jacob wrestled with the angel. Now, of course, he never knew it was an angel and he was fighting for his life. It brings me to the idea of when we are fearful. When we are fearful, we try to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves, to, to struggle for our lives. And he was going to meet his brother whom he feared would have hurt him. So there he was fighting for his life. And as the day dawned, he is realizing this is no ordinary person I'm fighting, or ordinary being. And then the being spoke to him, let me go for the days coming. And it's like, absolutely not i am going to hold on to you with every single strength i have until you bless me it is something like when we are praying and we are wrestling with the lord and we are staying upon our knees and wrestling until we gain the victory the angel changed his name he knew at that point he was forgiven he knew at that point he was not wrestling against an ordinary being and even though his hip was dislocated it did not matter it also shows me that when god takes possession of our lives the physical the things that happen outside of that salvation just does not matter as long as we feel safe and secure in the mighty arms of Jesus. So Jacob accepted the forgiveness of God. He recognized that he saw God face to face and his life was spared. Therefore, God had a special purpose for his life. To so much so that he renamed the place Peniel 
I think God is so merciful. No matter what we do, no matter how terrible the sin was, no matter how long we have run away from the Lord, when we come face to face with him and allow his saving grace to saturate our lives, we experience freedom. Amen. So our next question is for Dr. Ellis. So we'll ask Dr. Ellis to turn to Genesis chapter 49, verses 29 to 33. Though Jacob was no longer had any holdings in Canaan, what instructions did he give his sons regarding his burial? So it's Genesis 49, 29 to 33. It says, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there buried, there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. Though Jacob no longer had holdings in Canaan, what instructions did he give his sons regarding his burial? Jacob instructed his sons to bury him as it were in the family burial place, the place that Abraham would have acquired from the sons of Heth. His grandfather was buried there. His grandmother was buried there. His father was buried there. His mother also his wife, one of his wives, Leah, was buried there. And Jacob wanted to be buried there. One thing of note is that even though Rachel was the love of his life, Rachel was not buried there. Leah and we know the story of Jacob and Leah and what happened in Laban's house. Leah was the one who was buried there. And Jacob wanted to be buried with his family. The land of Canaan was promised to them. But until that time, they had not inherited the land. But here we see the faith of God the faith that they exercised in God, that Canaan was promised, and that promise will be delivered at some point. And so Jacob wanted to be with his family wherever they were. In our age, I don't know that burial places are so significant to us, but it was very, very significant, and it had spiritual lessons for the children of Israel. Amen. Dr. Ellis. <laughs> so, Dr. Ellis, the question here, our next question, a follow-up to the question we just asked, Elder Ellis, who else is buried in that cave? And why do you think Jacob made this request? So I am kind of going to repeat what Elder Ellis said. <clears throat> His whole, all the patriots, Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob, <clears throat> and their families, their wives were buried there. 
but they recognized that they were pilgrims and strangers and that they were looking for a better place, a better home. So keep us together, keep us in the cave because we know that no grave is going to keep our bodies down. So they did not see the promise, but they believed the promise. They looked forward to the promise. And Jacob and his family, he decided, he desired, he requested that he be placed with his family as they await the resurrection. So our next question. Now, <laughs> we know that as Christians, we are not perfect, right? But this gives us some food for thought. Now, Elder Ellis, Jacob was described as one of the individuals that God loved in the Bible, and he loved and feared God. Yet still, he deceived his brother, which we know is a sin in, it, uh, in and of itself. What does that tell us about the Christian walk, Elder Ellis? You know, that's why I like the Bible, Sister Joseph. I like the Bible because the Bible is a book that tells us how we can obtain salvation. But the Bible is a book also that shows us that God is dealing with real people. God shows what sin is. How sin in our lives can, as it were, distort what we would want to become. We tend to take things in our own hands, sometimes to help out God, which we are serving a God that needs no help. And so we see Jacob. We see Jacob, God knew Jacob. Jacob was not named Jacob by chance. When we look at the Israelites, when they gave their children names, the names were significant. And so Jacob of itself meant supplanter, deceiver, uh, I don't even want to go into some more other names to describe him, but the question is, Jacob loved the Lord, but why did he do some of these things that he did? And I started off by showing that the Bible is a book that shows us that people can make mistakes, but God is a merciful God. The Bible was written about the biographies of unfallen angels. There would have been no hope for us. But the Bible shows that there are real people. People who Christ and Jesus came. He was acquainted with our griefs, our sins, and so on. Yet he reached out to us and looked. Abraham was not perfect. Isaac was not perfect. Jacob was not perfect. David, even though the Bible described him as a man after God's own heart, he was not perfect. The only perfect being in the Bible was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ. And that's why he qualifies to take our place so that we could have a place, a place that he wants to give us, a place of perfection, because we could be covered by his robe of righteousness. And so, Jacob, eventually, we read the story there at Peniel, when he wrestled with the angels, Jacob became a changed person. And so there's hope for each of us that at some point we know that David became changed. Abraham, even though he showed uh, that he loved the Lord, he was willing to sacrifice his only son, yet he made mistakes. But at some point, 
God takes possession. At some point, we human beings surrender fully to God. The Holy Spirit works with us and we become changed. This person, we become a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away and behold, all things become new. God is a God of a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. He's a forgiving God. Amen, amen. Now our next question, and it's a personal one. So both our guests will be answering that for us this morning. It says, despite our mistakes, God can still bless us. How much better, however, to avoid the mistakes to begin with? What choices are you now facing and how can you avoid making the wrong ones? And begin with Dr. Ellis and then Ella Ellis will wrap up this question for us. This is a very serious question. And the thing is, we, we really do make a lot of mistakes. And then the Holy Spirit brings it to our minds and we begin to ask God forgiveness and I remember that I'm not going to really say on air, but just recently I made a decision and I was wrestling with the Lord, wrestling with the Lord. And then he gave me the answer. And only today I was able to go in his spirit and in his might and correct that whole situation. And I just this minute sitting here and saying to me, to myself, how oh, what a mighty God we serve. God is so gracious that he set up the entire scenario that it was like no big deal, just gotten it over with, gotten through with it. Because going ahead with that decision might have had some repercussions and not sinful or or something evil but it's just personal that you would not want to go ahead and deal with so i'm saying that as much as we might go ahead and make decisions that we have not consulted god enough about yet when he brings it to our minds and clarify that decision in our hearts he is faithful and merciful and just and kind and true that he helps us to clean up that mess and forgives us for our sins what a loving kind and mighty god we serve and i just thank god for who he is that even when we do not do things that are that are public and horrible to the to the eyes of human beings but personally in our own decision making process we realize that that choice was not the best choice he sets up the situation as long as we're willing to help us to correct it and to set us free and all i want to say is thank you jesus when we read the bible the bible tells us that these things are written for our examples we see so many persons in the bible make so many mistakes the patriarchs the prophets ourselves we make mistakes why because we should learn from the mistakes that others made in the Bible so that we should not repeat the same mistakes. There, there is no new thing upon the face of the earth. Everything that happened had happened before, but yet some of us foolishly, we tell ourselves that we learn by experience. No, we don't have to experience it to learn. Otherwise, we will experience pain and so on that we could have saved ourselves. But yet, perhaps it's because of the sinful nature that we possess. We disregard even the inner plane of the Holy Spirit sometimes. And we go down the road and make mistakes 
Sometimes they are mistakes, sometimes they are willful, and then we reap the consequence. We do not have to, but yet we do it. But God is merciful, and not that we want to just play on the mercy of God. God understands our nature, he understands our frame. We do not even understand ourselves, and that's why we should never say never, because sometimes we tell ourselves, we boast, oh, I will never do such and such, I will never do such and such. And then the next thing you know, we find ourselves in the situation, perhaps being tricked, perhaps being coerced, perhaps it is something that looks like enticing, and I'm not talking here about going down into the road of sin, but it might be an investment. The Bible tells us that we should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And sometimes we just narrow it down that the, what we are talking about here is marriage. And then we see a good business opportunity with an unbeliever. And then you go into that when the scripture says it, don't do it. We see here, uh, we have studied about co-signing and so on, and then somebody comes along and you feel sorry for them, and you want you sign on the dotted line, and then the next thing you know, you have to pay the person's debt. When the scripture tells you, don't do it. And then we learn from that, and you say, hey, I will never do this, you know. But God forgives us. And sometimes we have to depend on God to give us that spirit of forgiveness to forgive the person who leave us in the debt. But we should learn, we should follow the principles of God. They are always right and save ourselves some of the heartache, some of the consequences of our leaning on our own understanding. Amen. And we're winding down. We're coming to the end of our discussion this morning. And we cannot leave without our takeaways. So we're going to begin with Dr. Ellis again. And then Elder Ellis will wrap up for us our session this morning. What are some of the takeaways you learned or something that you hold strong to that was brought out in our lesson this morning. Okay, so I looked at Jacob's life. I looked at him listening to his mother, his desire to have the birthright, and his knowledge of knowing that the birthright was actually promised to him. Not trusting God enough to work this stuff out according to his will because God is able and God would have worked out that birthright so that Jacob would have gotten it but he decided to help out to help God to work it out and so often we decide that you know God is like Sarah God promised them a son but she couldn't wait so you know just go have this child and sometimes we are not patient enough to wait but my takeaway is, is that as long as i'm convinced in my heart that god has promised this to me that i will be patient enough to wait because whatever he says he is capable of doing and his arms are not too short I take away, I look at the caption of this study from Deceiver to Prince. And what I see is the love of God. Yes, the memory text for the, for the week asks the question, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? It reminds that, and Jesus speaks about it also, that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. And so we see that 
Uh, my takeaway here is that despite mistakes that I would have made in the past, there's a process, I see the process in B Jacob's life that he had to go through, he faced the consequences. These crucibles help him to be more grounded, to get back to the God of his fathers. And he was able to be transformed by relying on the same God that his father and his grandfather served. He had to rely for himself. I have to rely on God for myself. The salvation of my grandfather or my father is not going to save me. However, the God of heaven reaches out and reaches down so that I could be transformed from a deceiver to a prince. That has brought us to the end of our discussion this morning. And it was great to have you, our guest, and those who are viewing with us via our channel. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow when our topic will be Moses in Egypt. I hope you will study so that you'll be ready for our lesson tomorrow. Send the link to a family, send the link to a friend as we continue to study together.